Welcome back to Turpentine VC, a podcast where we discuss the art and science of building successful venture firms, VC to VC. Today's episode is with Will Quist, partner at Slow Ventures. Will talks about his transition from water polo player to co-founding Slow, the old model of VC versus new VC, treating venture capital like a PhD program, and more. Let's dive in. Will, welcome to Turpentine VC. Thanks so much for joining. Happy to be here, man. Love talking to you anytime. Yeah. Um, Will, for the, for those who are unfamiliar, wh- why don't you give a brief background of, of how you came up in this industry? You know, old venture capital versus new venture capital is going to be a theme that we that we talk about throughout this episode. But So let's give a bit of your, your background, how you came up in venture, and, and then we'll get into uh, how, how you built and evolved slow. Yeah, great. Um, I mean, I think there's two talk tracks. There's like the very meta talk track where I say I'm like a grumpy 80-year-old in a 40-year-old's body. Um, yes. I, I was good. actually... I'm actually sixth generation Bay Area on both sides of my family. So like my one grandmother grew up roping cattle in what is now Walnut Creek. And the other the other side with the first principal of Palo Alto High School was my great, great grandfather. So I think there's like one path through this is being around it forever and having a real affinity or, or knowledge of the history of the game. Um, so I think that I means literally riding my bike down Sand Hill Road to go play water polo <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, And so there's some first party knowledge that's just been passed out along the way of like how this, what has worked, what has, and what are some of the realities. And I think some of that gets lost. Um, My personal journey started um, after I was done being a professional water polo player and had to get a real life and was sure I wasn't going to work on the finance side of Silicon Valley, but um, very quickly began to see how exciting being on uh, the capital side at least was for me. So did, did the, Minimum viable investment banking stint just so I could be uh, in the game. And as I was interviewing for folks for more junior level positions, I ran into a group that was just getting started um, called Industry Ventures that had, at the time, a really novel take on venture. And you have to remember in 2006 and seven, people were still debating, would the IPO landscape come roaring back like it hadn't existed for 30 or 40 years, which was there was only enough money in Silicon Valley for a Series A and maybe a B. And I was like, great. You're, now is when you go public, you get sold, you wind down. Um, the bubble kind of, the 2000 bubble compressed that, then it lengthened it. And, and in 2006 or 7, there was this debate of like, will it return? And I think Industry Ventures had an interesting thesis that no, the private capital landscape has changed forever. IPOs are going to take forever. And that that time in the private markets, there really isn't a set of capital products to replicate what happened publicly around primary financings. I think we anchored on early on there around the secondary market that there were going to be all these people that you were so used to selling stock once the company went public that um, that they'd want that kind of liquidity. So anyway, met a, met a scrappy young group that had a thesis that not a lot of people understood that made sense to me and thought, Hey, this will be really fun. It makes sense to me intellectually. It, pa- it kind of passes the sniff test with a lot of folks I can call on the thesis. And when it doesn't work, I'll have a really good business school essay, right? And then I'll get on the right track. Um, and lucky for me, it was the right thesis run by a great group of guys that um, kind of kept just being entrepreneurial within it. it kind of bought an early small fund of funds and were early to the small VC fund space. And just did a lot of creative things. So they had a great run there. Um, spent seven or eight years. We scaled AUM, scaled team, scaled the kind of deals. Had a great time. And then I made the, what now looks like really irrational choice to start my own firm. I was probably 32 at the time, which now 32-year-olds start their start their own firms all the time. But back, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, it wasn't as common. Um, and so I, I was going to go out and raise my own fund from what I'd learned. And right as I was doing that, the guys at Slow were kind of who had been historically investing their own money through a group of friends were considering taking outside capital and making this a business. And so we all were at dinner and said, wait, you know what I don't know. And I know what you don't know. Maybe we should all do this together. And that's kind of the the genesis story of me ending up in, in this seat kind of right at day zero of Slow taking outside capital and spending the next however many years refining the model. Talk about that first set of conversations with you in the Facebook group uh, at Slow uh, when you realized, when you were envisioning what kind of firm you wanted to build and how does it compare to what it looks like today? Talk, talk about the evolution of Slow and the different kind of decisions you made along, along the way. 
we weren't super deliberate. I think I think some of the logic was, hey, we have a unique set of skills across the entire group, a, a, a unique set of access. We kind of had this thing where we were all really young, but had actually been in seats that mattered for a serious amount of time, which we thought was like a pretty unique skill set. Um, Kev obviously had been an early employee at Facebook, Sam had been VP of product, I'd been a general partner. Like there was a unique set of skills for people in their early 30s. And so that that to me was like the core, the core of it is like, hey, there's going to be something here. I think we also realized that there was probably going to be a top tier venture fund of our age group built over that period, right? That it wasn't that we were reaching a point in the pendulum in the cycle where guys like us, I mean, I don't know, everyone aspires to be benchmark, but you, you look at when Gen 1 at Benchmark kind of said, hey, we've learned enough. We think we have an opinion on how to do it our own way, how to do it differently, it kind of happens in this age group and demographic. So I think that was, that. Was, and honestly, the, la- the real guiding light out of it, as we all spoke about it, was like, it better be really fun. Because if it's not really, really fun, we can all go do other things, right? And and it can be as lucrative or maybe even more. But it but it, it, this could be really, really fun building something with a group of fa- friends that um, I think uh, importantly, one of the aligning things is like, we both just realized, we all realized it was just capital. If that makes sense, I think there was there was a grandiosity to, to the practice of venture capital at the time, which you definitely want to have a respect for the capital you manage. But I think for me coming from the later stage markets and my partners coming from inside Facebook, there was like a healthy levity we had for the actual role and impact that venture plays in the overall equation of company building. Um, and that it probably could be pretty fun if we wanted it to be. Yeah. And so when you say just capital, is that, is that a broader idea that it's sort of a pushback against this idea that venture capitalists should provide all these services uh, to, 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 to companies? Um, and if so, you, do you compete with them by just doing different companies than, than they would? Because founders off, if there's one firm that says, hey, I'm going to do nothing for you besides capital, that's not what you're saying. I'm just saying. And another firm says, hey, I'm going to do all these things for you. Wouldn't the simple thinking be that the founder is probably going to take the person who's going to want to do all those things? Maybe. I mean, we were definitely anti-platform, so to speak, kind of from from the jump here at Slow, and that that was like a governing feature that I don't know. We all say things different ways. And so like, I'm sure people go cross references against what, I mean, that's one of the fun parts about slow is like, there's no divine narrative here and there's no sacred cows. So you'll hear us all say different things. I, my line on this for a long time has been 95 to 105% of the value I've seen created in companies comes from the team themselves. I, I just can't find a situation where I feel like you can give outsiders credit for more than 5%. And I think we can all point to a handful of situations where advisors, outsiders have created higher bars for founders, unfortunately. Um, so uh, there, there's, I don't know, first principle seems like such a grand phrase, but I really do think for whatever reason, we kind of start with a ground truth of why here. And maybe it's because none of us came from like a top tier venture background where there was a divine way of doing things. But I think when you when you really unpack it, you can only impact what you have context for and control over. And as an investor with a portfolio, no matter how deep your services team, like you only have so much context and so much control. So I, I think we kind of started from there, just being honest about, you can offer a lot of these things. They may move the needle. The most they'll move the needle is 5%. But the reality is you, you're going to have episodic context and episodic control. And so I think when we, when we think about value add, or at least I do, it kind of came from the, like, all right, well, if you would make those assumptions, and I think one of the important things to do in startups and ventures, everyone everyone loves to go there's like, hey, there's always the outlier, the edge case, and everyone operates from like a set of infinity variables, which I think is actually really, really hard and, and not productive for founders or like, hey, anything truly is possible. It's like, okay, but I'm not sure that that's really helpful as a uh, guiding light. Um, anyway, if you assume what I've just said, like, Someone, don't be negative 5%. I think we do a really good job of that. And that was a guiding light out of the gate of like, let the founders build, let them run with the company, be here as a resource. Um, number two is, is think about how can you be effective with, in that final 5%, and it's not scientific number, how can you be effective in there with the context, control, skills you have? And my personal view has really become that a founder's most important job 
is to be a better investor in their own company than than we are. At the end of the day, I mean, and, and it's funny, you find that in any any book about at scale amazing companies, right? Whether you read Munger or you read John Malone or Outsiders, right? Like the CEO's core role is an allocation role of, hey, I'm going to use X money or Y time to generate Z outcome that should have ABC impact on valuation. I think we got away from that a little bit in Silicon Valley. That still remains the guiding light. The good thing is, while well, like the DNA of really being an amazing investor is 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 hard to replicate. I think there is enough of an apprenticeship model and a, enough to learn about the tactics of being a good investor that it's a learnable skill. And so long way of saying like, I actually think the most important thing we can do, especially in the first 18 to 24 months of a company's life is to help them become a better investor in their own business. And it turns out that's where our skills are probably sharpest at the moment, right? We're sitting every day making decisions, watching time and money and, and outcomes lead to enterprise value. So I think that's really where I've, tried to hang my hat with folks is like, listen, the biggest thing we can do if you just kind of with our context, with our control, with our skill set, and if you think about magnitude of impact is help you make much better investment decisions in your own business, then hopefully it takes on a life of their own. They understand their business better. They, they take off. And I mean, and I think you can reverse engineer from, from people like Mark Zuckerberg, who have turned out to be fantastically generational allocators um, within their business. So that's, be, and I think on top of that, like be good people, you know what I mean? Know enough people that when there is a connection that needs to be made, you're not six hops away from it. But um, but I think I, I've really hung my hat on helping founders by helping them become better allocators themselves, um, because that's where we have skills, context, and control. How, how do you do that? Or what, what's an example of, of, of just to make it sort of more concrete for for the audience? What, what does that look like? Well, I think the, <laughs> how do you become a better investor? I'm going to give away all the secrets. Um, <laughs> I mean, number number one for me in that is always acknowledging that investing is a luck-based endeavor and not a skill-based game. And so just from the bat, the way you get better at luck-based games is different. And the way you improve your odds on luck-based games is different than skill-based games. And anyone interested, there's a book that changed the course of my career called uh, The Success Equation by Michael Mabusian, who's at the Santa Fe Institute, a good friend of Josh Wolf, someone I haven't been lucky to meet personally yet, but I've read, read everything he writes religiously. And it just is a good breakdown of like, what do you do in luck-based games, right? And the reality is luck-based games are about really intelligent decision-making frameworks gu guided by history, but with your own twist that you execute, execute really consistently. That's how you, it's, it's blackjack, right? It's, it's understanding the probabilities around blackjack and executing them consistently. Not every decision is going to break your way, but if you execute in that fashion, the odds. So that's kind of number one in helping people begin to view the world like an investor. It's just that acknowledgement of, of what game they're playing. Um, and then from there, I think there's a pretty simple set of tactics to begin to understand how does enterprise value accrue, right? How do you use capital to, like, what are the components of enterprise value? What are the derivatives of it? How do you begin to see it? Um, and and in that kind of much more, I don't know, I, I wrote something in reference to DCF a number of times. Someone said, you can't expect founders to understand what a DCS is. I'm like, these people are way smarter than I am. You know what I mean? Like, and they're asking to manage millions of dollars. Like, I think you can take a take a detour and kind of unpack more traditional equations for enterprise value. Then I think the third lever is getting really comfortable with the history of your space and how capital, right? Most things rhyme. There there are novel stories, but not novel plots. And so I think it's getting really comfortable with the history of either what you're building, the space you're building, and the business model you're going out, and, ha and how capital has historically been used and performed, and at least using that as a guiding light for your decision-making. So it's usually a conversation through those three steps. Um, and then really setting up, I mean, we're kind of not dogmatic about boards at the seed stage, but you have that kind of ongoing relationship and have making sure the conversations feel much more like an investment committee than a check-in on product or something like that. Yeah. Hey. We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey everyone, Eric here. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from our AI and investing cluster of podcasts, to shows that drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, investors, and influencers, like Econ 102 with Noah Smith. 
We're launching new shows every week and we're looking for industry leading sponsors. If you think that might be you and your company, email me at ericaturpentine.co. That's E R I K at turpentine.co. And let's partner together. I want to zoom out to one of your bigger ideas, which is sort of this old venture capital model versus new venture capital model, or, or, or more precisely, maybe like what is true venture capital versus what it, what is not true venture capital? What is the role of venture capital? You, you have uh, you have thoughts and opinions here. Please please share them. Yeah, uh, this gets me in hot water with friends, and so I should say, like, <laughs> beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and there are obviously lots lots of ways to generate. Uh, generate returns. I think my more prolific sharing partner, Sam Lesson, is very much on record saying 95% of venture capitalists don't practice venture capital. It's just capital. Um, I think there's two, it's kind of the high level framing of it, in our opinion. And and then I, I kind of a more granular take on it for me personally that, um, that I think does stem from a bit of the history. And I, and I should say, guiding under this is like, a kind of dogmatic belief that if you have a tool, if you use the tool you have appropriately, it increases your odds of getting the outcome, right? If you, have, if you want to use something to its best ends, that's how you get the best outcomes, I think is, is something I, I believe, or at least simplified my life to believe. Um, at, at the highest level, I think the question is like, we're all running around trying to find novel hypotheses, people building value creation in net new ways that are defensible. I, I We talk a lot about like, is our job to kind of fund the creation of the data, right? I, it's kind of, it's this data creation versus data replication game. Uh, is is our job to go and get the first data set that proves your hypothesis correct? Or is it our job to, to make a calculated guess and bet on and fund the replication of the data set? Does that make, does that make sense? I, I always say will things and I'm not sure they resonate, but does yeah, that uh, make yes. sense as a principle? It, it does, but flesh it out a little bit more just for, so the audience uh, can, can make sure they get it. So again, back to we all want novel hypotheses, right? You believe you believe the world works in X and X way, and we all agree that if it works in X way, it's important. There's a valuable business to be had. I think the the question people need to ask themselves as venture capitalists is like, is your job with the money you have, with the hammer that you've been given, is your job to fund the first data sets that prove that hypothesis true or false, right? Just assuming you go into it with no first party data. Is your job to fund the creation of that data set that validates or invalidates the hypothesis? Or is the job of venture capital to, to replicate the data past some known scale, right? Are, are, you looking, are, you, is that, you're, are you looking for that first data set? Where they, and I think in our opinion, that's where the true breakthroughs come and the true breakthroughs in value creation come, honestly, is, is the net new novel, novel data set that, that proves that something is actually valuable versus betting on that, replicating it more scale. Um, and I, I think it's important to note, like one thing that has really clouded the landscape in my mind is businesses can have different moments where they call for venture capital across their history in, in that box. Right. Um, and, and I think open door is one that has come to mind of a business. And and I think I've referenced this before in other places, but like there was a moment down the line where there was a novel hypothesis that if they could be X amount of traffic and Y amount of the top locales, right? If they had if they had enough listings, they'd get a critical mass. They'd become a third party you'd have to check next to Trulia and Zillow. And that would dramatically drop customer acquisition costs. You'd basically be an organic search result. That's like a pretty novel proposition that they didn't have data on. So like I, I, they were already at a lot of scale, but funding that round to me would feel like using venture capital. So it, it, I, I do want to like disabuse this notion that venture capital is always about stage gating and valuation. And it's, and it's much more about, are you at the data? Are, are you helping create the data set to validate or invalidate a hypothesis versus funding the replication of it? And, and when you're funding the replication of it, what are other like, what are the other uh, funding models that you think should be more in vogue, or that in, instead of venture capital, founders should be doing X, Y, Z as a result? One answer is like growing slower. <laughs> like I, I think venture capital for explosive growth unto itself. Like I, I understand where there's moments where that feels like a, a use of capital. I think it's just capital. I'm not sure it's venture. So I think there's a world where like you just grow at a more organic clip and a more organic rate. Um, I think there are some amazing visions of the world, novel hypotheses that 
are better served in a, in a nonprofit capacity, candidly, right? Where you just can't justify the commercialization milestones of it unless, I mean, there are some great founders who, I mean, I think that's one of Elon's greatest skills is his ability to get the capital markets to fund NPV negative things or things that'll, the things that'll be absent commercial milestones for so long that it's hard to justify them in most cases. Um, yeah. And, and then there's the good old bootstrap, which, which isn't a great answer because there are things that require an irrational amount of capital to test. I'm just not sure all of them fit the mold for venture capital. What are your thoughts on kind of the indie VC style of thinking? I mean, there's a lot of businesses that shouldn't be raising venture, um, but maybe should be doing some other sort of funding mechanism um, kind of in the, in the earliest stages. What, um, what, what is the right way of thinking about, you know, which businesses are appropriate for, for venture versus, versus, you know, should be thinking about other models, like earliest on? Well, one, I think Bryce, who's a very close friend, I think Indy kind of took on a life of its own because I don't actually would think what he's saying is like, don't build venture scale businesses. Yeah. Um, and, and I think he would admit that he is a venture capitalist. I think what he has, the, the actual nuance to his structure is like, I'm not sure you need to be stuck on the venture path for the, all of your life, that every round of capital needs to come from a venture capitalist and that you need to be pursuing irrational business tactics or what can appear to be irrational business tactics forever, right? That some businesses may only call for a million and a half dollars of venture capital. And after that, maybe they just need debt. Maybe they just need to run. So I, I one, I would say that that, that would be my, after spending lots of time one-on-one -on -one with him, like that would be my distillation of what Bryce is really trying to accomplish, which is like, again, if, if you take venture as like some irrational experimental capital to prove something is true, like I think he would say, I still want to be that. I want to give you, you know what I mean? I want to give you some money that's like short-term irrational, but long-term unbelievably strategic. But I don't want to presuppose, as Sam has put, that you're on the factory farm method of venture capital. So that that would be a clarification I feel like I need to make every time I hear Indy come up. Um, and look, I think, I think if you're trying to diagnose yourself, like, hey, I want to build a business, does it require venture funding? I mean, I, I think the, the box that I talk about wanting to fund is is a novel hypothesis around value creation. Like you're going to go and go away and do something that creates absolute and relative value to others. You can prove it definitively. You can run an experiment. So it's like you have that novel take on value creation. Can you actually prove it? Can you run a controlled experiment and get a get a yes or a no? Can you do that on relatively little capital, right? Or at least little capital to the reward. And, and does it, are, does the output data like does it make you objectively more valuable? I think my partner Sam would push to people like having commercial data on the side of that. I think I'm a little more lenient that I think there is data points that the capital markets coalesce around to that they will continue to fund. But I think of it as that box. And so I think when we spend a lot of time with founders early on who want to build, who have a sense of product, it's really kind of one helping them make an absolute discovery because I don't think anybody should start the build processing, I want to use venture capital, right? I think you should start with where are you inspired and where do you have unfair insights and that kind of stuff. But when it gets down to the bottom floor, it's really trying to understand does that box, quote unquote, for venture for venture exist? Yeah. One classic willism is uh, this idea that every good investment should look like a semiconductor company. Can you uh, can you explain that? <laughs> that is a good. Uh, that is one that I get typecast with um yeah I, I i mean in my mind and there's going to be like true semi-investors these days who are going to call me out and call my bluff but i kind of harken back to the 80s which is like you had you would have founders who've done a deep amount of research about what is likely and possibly true within the semiconductor space who would have a very well researched and defined hypothesis usually on a chip that could be 10x faster or produce 10x cheaper and what they needed was like a little bit of irrational money at the earliest stages to go out and kind of go zero to one on that chip and then also prove that what they did in a lab can be done right at some commercial grade. That, that was an experiment that didn't cost a ton of money, right? So you had a novel hypothesis on value creation for the world. It kind of knew where is the world going? What is the novel thing that creates value within there? You had a very well-defined controllable experiment that didn't take infinity dollars to get an answer to. 
and the output data, right? If you were able to do that, if you were 10x faster or cheaper, right? And, and with some replicability of rolling it off, that is that was like an unbelievable atomic unit of value, right? It, it meant that you were going to go take it, take a ton of market share and take it cheaply. And so that little box, you put a little bit of money into that box, you might get a no. You've got to be open to getting a false. But if you got a true answer, it was like objectively and dramatically much more valuable than it was when you were started and a, another tier of capital with lower risk and lower return threshold so they could have be more, they could kind of pay higher prices could understand the story. And so the, the value would accrue. So I think that's like my, it's probably an oversimplification, but the rhetorical device I use to kind of think about situations where venture is called for and performs well. Yeah. Now, You've had this thesis, you, you and Slow have had this thesis around franchises as an example, which is a type okay. of business that other firms wouldn't, or isn't obvious that that is appropriate for venture. What do you believe that maybe other others don't as it relates to franchises more just broadly of like, yeah, wh why does that fit within the, the venture framework? Like how do, how do we get there? Yes, <laughs> please. Because 2022 and 23, we've had a lot of time for exploration. Um, I mean, I think there were a couple ways we arrived at this. I think one was knowing part of venture working is you own beautiful businesses on the other side. So you kind of just, if you inverted and said like, oh, when venture really works, you end up owning a stake in a business that has like super, it generates free cash flow super efficiently, durably, can scale, right? Super equity efficient. And so one, one exercise was just kind of a reverse engineering of the capital markets of like, what are the most beautiful business models? that we can find, right? That grow consistently, don't consume tons of equity, have really great net income and free cash flow dynamics, dot, dot, dot. Uh, I think any search of that will quickly surface up the franchise model to folks. So I think there was, that was kind of like one screen where like, oh, we should probably take this interest, take this seriously, or at least unpack if there is a venture moment within these businesses. I think when you dig into them, you realize that there is a moment where there is a novel hypothesis on value creation that is pretty testable and it doesn't take a ton of money. It's just more money than a franchisee will generate in a short amount of time. And if you're correct, it's wildly valuable. It's not actually at the consumer level. I think, I think that kind of falls, the, the value proposition for most franchises out of the gate ends up being pretty subjective and, and hard to test and measure. Um, but the bet that... Once you have two or three locations, right, and they're, they generate a certain economic profile, there is a novel bet that that economic profile, that atomic unit of that, that franchise can replicate, right, and, and can be, that outcome can be generated by people who are not the founders, and they can be generated by people that sign up. That, that's a novel hypothesis, and each business has its own, and historically, that moment has kind of happened year seven, eight, nine, when you've got, right, you grow corporate locations, stack enough free cash flow, and you can spend the couple million bucks you need to build the business in a box, so to speak, and then have the runway to test it to see, great, how do I, how do I get franchisees, get them up and running, get enough runway, and so I have the data that suggests the performance I got at my corporate units will replicate. Um, and so all of a sudden, it's like, okay, these are really rad businesses to own at the end, and it turns out they have they have a moment, they have a, a venture type box in here. Um, and so I think that really set us off running down the path to unpack it more and explore to see, it would take that out of the lab and out of the theory and see what it really meant in practice. Um, and I think got great feedback from the franchise ecosystem from people who run them, advise them, et cetera. I will say it began to also dovetail with our take on vertical SaaS, which is that Software eating the world isn't necessarily going to mean infinity more software companies. And, and that actually, if you actually just think of it selfishly from a founder's lens of, I created something really novel that changed these, the economics of something. How do I, how do I, what's the most efficient value capture path? And, and I think we're learning that isn't always 80% gross margin because a lot of industries have a certain dynamic. But what software does is it obviously reduces the variability in outcomes. And so if you can begin to have franchises, right, that are leveraging software based tools, to get more consistent outcomes on operations, it kind of is, is another accelerant, right? To franchises being unbelievable businesses and, and begin to have some real overlap with a more historical network of venture deals. Yeah. Um, 
that's a well articulated a, a, a quote that you had related to the previous point that you, you tweeted recently was um the point of raising using working with venture capital should be getting a true or false answer not success or failure i, I thought that was a good quote yeah that's something that's really important to me that i like stress early on with founders and, and i and i it's really hard to say because when you're in it success feels like all that matters um it, and again i i understand it i think choosing to build a business with venture right it does change some of the dynamics where you're not necessarily just running a pizza joint to keep the lights on day to day that that you actually need to be going into it with a grand supposition a grand thesis that if true is wildly valuable and and if you're going to do that you need to be very open to getting a false answer right to any experiment you run and so that 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 to me is just another distinguishing way of going through the fundraising pipeline of, right, should I should I or should I not take work with venture capital? Um, and, I, and I think that, that viewing it through the lens of, oh, I'm raising it because I want to find out if something is true or false, not because I want to hustle and build a great business is, is a good intellectual test for raising and working with venture capital. Yeah. Let's, um, let's do a brief deep dive on slow the fund itself in terms of how you guys have thought about fund size, how you guys have thought about portfolio construction, size of companies per fund, because you guys have done really well and um, are eminently fundable. And thus you were in a position where you could play whatever game you wanted, right? You could play the box group game, maybe how you guys started a little bit kind of participatory and in, in a bunch of great companies. You could play the first round game or the USV benchmark, game, like really concentrated, just, you know, sm small side of companies. You could play the multi-stage game because of your ability to, to, to raise your great marks. Um, and you decided to do... Um, not exactly any one of those three things, but maybe a maybe a you know little bit of each, um, if I understand correctly. But leading more towards the you know concentration in, in a smaller amount of companies. Why don't you talk about how you guys have thought about fund size, portfolio construction, and amount of companies per fund, and why that makes sense for for your strategy and uh, you know where the market is? Yeah, it's um, a good question. I'm not sure. I it's kind of one of these things that's been built up over time. It'll take me a second to unpack the, the pithy one-liner answer. I mean, I think at one layer, we always said that we didn't want to be Series A investors, right? That we weren't we weren't comfortable being hyper competitive and have a diff, having a having an edge in that market, right? So I think that rules out certain portfolio theories and certain scales of funds. Um, I mean, I think a lot of this has been pretty organic, right? We started with a $65 million fund where we kind of had the mandate to do, it had a very broad mandate of what we were going to do. And I think we increasingly found ourselves in situations, we were probably writing 300 to 500 grand seed checks when we were doing that fund, where we were getting there, getting to the table and, and candidly waiting for someone who could write a bigger check. So I think there, there was that portion of it saying there seemed to be an organic opportunity of things we thought were really exciting and worth doing that we were now getting to conviction to moving to and, and waiting. And so I think there was a bit of the theory of like, why would we wait versus be a million and a half dollar fund lead the round? And this is seven, eight years ago, but like, why, why wouldn't we do that? So I think that was one elevation in the model. Um, I think we found ourselves increasingly with strong points of view, right? And, and while we don't have a platform team, like, engaging with founders increasingly, right? Not just being someone nice in the cap table, but kind of having an ongoing Sam likes to say we're always on text message with our founders and like continuing engagement. And I think as a lot of the old heads will tell you, as, as your time gets pulled in a direction, you kind of need to meet it with some ownership because that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the non-scalable, non-scalable resource. So I think that pulled us more into being ownership sensitive. Um, and then I think there's the acknowledgement that we are taking a fair amount of risk, right? And we are walking down some unknown paths. And so too small of an N is probably not a responsible portfolio dynamic. So I would say that I, I, there was no grand summit where we zoomed out and said, this is exactly it for those reasons. I think there was more of an organic discovery of who we, who we were, the work we wanted to do and could do in a differentiated way. Um, what was available to us candidly from a market opportunity and then what was the right capitalization path. And I will say, I think having, peers and friends and mentors like box and first round, right. And being able to sit with them and go, what were the pluses and minuses? Cause folks were a step or two ahead. I think we were, we were very 
deferential and willing to learn about the pluses and minuses of, of the different uh, the different strategies from a portfolio theory. And and so why not you know ten companies less or ten com- or, or twenty companies more? Ha, ha, like what is sort of the ideal amount of companies to fund? I I don't know that I, I think it's false precision. I mean wh- what we target is forty to forty five companies per fund. I think that's like become a pretty standardized number for the funds in our set, whether that's first round or kindred or others. Um, I don't think we're hard. In fact, I mean I think at, at Slow, we're always open to intellectual debate to revisit premises, but I, I think that is the number that has felt like that gets us the right amount of shots on goals for the opportunity to really sink into one um, without being so so diluted on the impact. So I, I, I don't know. To me, it feels past a certain point that there's some false precision in the science. If I do 55 portfolio companies or I do 39, I, I, I think it's kind of the buckets of like, do you do 10 or 12 things? Do you do 500 things? Or, you know what I mean? Or, or are you someone that's somewhere in the middle? And, and again, I think that becomes stage dependent and, and, and in how strong a view you have on, on underwriting candidly. Yeah. So, some people think that venture is, is strongly bifurcating where there are these aggregative, you know, aggregated multi-stage firms and then these like, you know, small specialists. T- talk about the, the, how you think about the right for a, a, a small but sizable you know, funds such as yourself, a smaller but sizable funds such as yourself to have the right to to, to play in, in a world of uh, of multi stage firms. And maybe you could also speculate on where, where multi stage is going. I mean, this is where the tired trope on consensus non consensus comes out. Um, and, and again, I think it's something that can is probably overused and even overused by us. But I think that we do spend a lot of I at least spent a lot of time thinking about what is our job vis-a-vis those big funds who are unbelievable at getting in front of talented founders, talented networks, and, and spotting um, spotting opportunities. And I think, listen, I think our job is to get comfortable and an insight into a risk that is one click more than they're willing to take, it, it, it is, is my honest answer. And I think for a bunch of reasons, the larger you get – the risk appetite, right? The the point at which in, in the flipping of cards you want to deal in, if you think of like, hey, you got to flip five cards and they all come up your way and you have a public company, the the card flip you want to come in does change the more scale you get. Your incentive structure changes, the ability of where you're able to spend your time changes. Um, and, and candidly, they've, they've earned that right to kind of probably take less risk than we do because they've sat in their chairs and built great brands and put up amazing returns for years and years and years. So I think that's, that's the real discussion I, I have in my own head of like, Hey, what risk are we taking? What are we, what are we taking on? Right. And almost, I assume that they're, they're like perfectly, ra- perfectly rational, intelligent actors, which I think for the most part they are right. That they're, they're, they're understanding risk reward as well as anybody when they choose not to do something. And so then the question becomes like, why am I comfortable with it, right? Is it a price thing? Is it an insight thing? Does my money make those risks, right? Does my money make those risks go away in their mind because they're rational actors and price goes up? So I, I think that's happy. To, I mean, I'm happy to unpack it more. That's that's it in a nutshell, though, is like, where can we go that others can't or won't right now? Um, so so what you're saying, Will, is you want, you don't want to be competing with these multi-stage firms. You want to be going where they're, where they're not. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think we have. And again, everyone has different views on this. Like, I'm not sure we have a great business model for competing with them on pretty known, quantifiable risk paradigms. So I think it, it becomes incumbent on us. Can we do something? You know, can we? Can we? And, and I, I think the thing you have to learn is like, there is such a thing as too much risk, right? So can you find this balance of intelligently taking on risk and getting compensated for it? I think is our job. And I think in in a world of aggregators or increasing aggregators who are kind of all playing the same game, there becomes a real role for people who can do that consistently and intelligently. That's a, that's a good segue into your, your slow PhD program. Uh, that we program great- is program program is like a very, it, there's no yeah. other way to say it, but it is much more grandiose than it actually yes. is as it plays out. But yes. So I, I love, uh, talk about what it is and then talk about the philosophy behind it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 
at its highest level marketing, it's our way of working with people who are in the I want to build phase. Um, I think it's easy to start with what it isn't, which is like it's not an incubator. These aren't our, these aren't our ideas. It's not an accelerator. We don't want folks coming in that are already kind of halfway through the experiment and want want help running the experiment more quickly. This isn't an EIR. We're not paying people on salary. We're not taking equity. It's it's none of those things. And in a to me again, it feels like a throwback to real venture where founders may have a real strong worldview and a sense of what they build in it, but diligence from old venture funds took four to six months because not because the VC was skeptical, but because there were a bunch of legs of the story as it relates to risks around market development and risks and the value proposition and quantifying it in the business model, right? There were a bunch of things that needed to be double checked and verified before everybody said, hey, it's worth the founder's time and it's worth our money. Um, so so that that's kind of what it is in. I mean, I think my path to getting here has been uh, it was a funny journey when all of a sudden it just hit me in the face. I think one leg of the story is coming from the later stage, spending more time on the early stage. I, I, I guess one weird belief I have, or I don't know if it's weird or not, is like I really do think you need to believe that you have some chance of buying public stock at the first day that you invest. That like you can't know whether it's 10% or a 90% chance, but on a binary scale, you can kind of squint and go like, hey, if all the dominoes fall their direction, is this a company that can take earnings calls? You know what I mean? Or or can write up an S1 that's really compelling. And so I, I do think you want to know on a binary scale, do you have a chance of that? So I spent a lot of time really on going, all right, that's where we're shooting for. Like, I know what those look like because I've invested at the later stages. And then I just became coming, okay, well, the S1 just ends up being the summation of a bunch of other things you believe being true. Rarely do you work against the grand vision of the company. You do a thing to do a thing to do a thing to do a thing. And so felt like these sub hypotheses were developing and a lot of the diligence and pitch meetings with founders were really mapping out the dominoes of what would need to happen and how did they think about when and why. It was a really fun, dynamic conversation. Somewhere along the way, it, it just hit me in the face right as I was making the parallel of hypotheses and it's like, oh, if that, this looks like a dissertation. You stand up, you got a bunch of data, you pull together in 90 pages and you stand up and defend it uh, on Wall Street and not within it. So I kind of seized on that language for a while and, and went down and went down the path. I think the more I unpacked it, um, it, it, I started unpacking it more when you kind of ran, when we ran into this era of, hey, I'm just going to fund you. Like first thing, like, you know what I mean? Super excited. We all know the story of like super exciting friend, really smart, tells me they want to work on something. I want to be supportive. I immediately say yes, right? And I mean, that obviously picked up and was happening in an accelerated fashion. And it didn't sit right with me intellectually that that was like the proper path, really from a founder standpoint, right? That their, that their opportunity cost was being really, truly measured and valued in a way that they were aware of at minimum or optimizing. And so I kind of was sitting with that, sitting with this dissertation analogy. And, and that's when it hit me that the way a great PhD program works, and the, or the point of a great PhD program is to increase the odds of being novel and correct. And put you on the most efficient path to getting yeses and nos because resources are scarce. And so once I viewed it that way, you start unpacking more and more of how the ecosystem was operating in, in kind of in contrast to the PhD programs. And you realize one of the key, key things that, that was lost, that PhD programs have decided one way you increase the odds of being novel and correct or making sure that you have a master's degree. Professionally, that's hard to define, but you have some depth or breadth in a category that has given you, right? You have depth and breadth in a category. You have some ability to think 1% differently or learn to, and that th those two things give you the best odds at, at flushing out novel and correct. And so that was kind of the final straw, right, in my mind of like, hey, we, under we understand this part, or at least the process by which kind of the gates you should jump through if what you really want to do was increase, max out your odds or at least be aware of them and then understand a credible, efficient operating path. Why don't we, I mean, this seems to make sense. I couldn't find an intellectual hole. Why don't we find some friends who we know want to build and see if there was some set of framework and core curriculum? So we did that, found some friends who trust us, like us, had free time to burn, whatever it was, and went through the process um, and, and just had, had a blast on all fronts. It, it ended up being extremely valuable to the folks going through it. 
was super interesting work, uh, work for us to do. Um, and was leading to interesting outcomes. And, and it, and it kind of went back to this idea to take our talk somewhat full circle that a founder's most important job is, is to be an investor first, right? Is to be an allocator of, of time and money. And I find what this program does is help us really help the founder get a clear lens on the opportunity cost investment they're making. And I think, listen, you can play this out on your own network, but when you think about the people you enjoy backing or want to back, a lot of them have pretty high opportunity costs. I don't know what they could take per year of RSUs, but it's not nothing, right? And so when you start realizing that as soon as you incorporate and say yes to a scout check, you're probably in this for two, but more likely three years, no matter the outcome, sacrificing it, if you begin to realize this is like a multi-million dollar investment founders are making into the world's most like volatile asset class. Um, and so this kind of presents as a really helpful and consistent, almost objective way to help them right? It, it, it be aware of the investment they're making and how they might shape it such that they I, that they maximize their opportunity cost. So I don't know if that explains it. I've had a hard time getting it out succinctly and in a way that answers all the questions because it's a bit of a weird out there take. But um, well, well, the, the well, net of it is we're spending a ton of time with people that we feel like have depth and breadth and high opportunity cost and trying to work with them really. And no, some we talk to every week, some it's every day, some every month. Like it's really we're not trying to set this up for scale and productizing and structure. We're trying to do this in as organic a fashion as possible and help them navigate kind of the idea maze in line with some of the principles that have emerged from PhD programs um, that have kind of increased, increased odds for folks pursuing it. And, and in, the, in, the, in that way, it's very different than the Y Combinators or the on decks or the entrepreneur first or other sort of, you know, more structured, more formal sort of programmatic. Uh, ways, right? Totally. A a absolutely. And I, and I think they, listen, it's hard to argue almost everyone who's doing it and, and still doing it today has enough case studies to say like this works and it works for people. So I, I, I think it does end up being a dramatically different flavor. I think where we've seen success is with people who have connectivity to how the game of venture capital works, right? They have, they're, they're, they're in it. They, they have some sense of how to raise and use venture and where to access it and kind of um, and so that's not a governing or kind of a gating item. Um, but they're also, they have significant opportunity costs and they're aware of it. They might be a second time founder who has already been in it, um, or have real credible roles and opportunities they'd be turning down to, to go after it. Not to say YC doesn't attract those people. I mean, Parker Conrad went through it with Rippling, like they get, they get a lot of them. I, I think we've just seen more appeal from, uh, more appeal from those types of founders, and again, from people who want to walk through it pretty programmatically and defend their own opportunity cost. And we don't start with, you're going to raise venture. Let's think of an idea. It's like, we start with, where do you know more than other people? How do you think that world works? When the world works that way, what is built, right? And really work down the funnel that way. And, and applying venture capital becomes almost the last step rather than the first step of the process. You, you tweeted something to the effect of, if you want to start something, the first things to figure out are, what do you think is true? How is the cost, time, and money to find out? And how valuable is it if you're right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a little bit of me re-describing my box, right? I, I think starting something to start something is fine. Yeah, listen, you only live once. Do whatever you want. Um, I mean, I think in my experience, it really, it's, it's dramatically impactful when you can start with, like, I'm just addicted to convince the world is going to work in this certain way. And I think the further out the time horizon, the more impactful you can be and it can be candidly. Um, but start, starting with that and then beginning to understand, like I said, what needs to be built in that world? When everybody's connected to the internet, what are all the things that are built, right? And trying to understand which ones get built at which time, uh, at which point you can begin to make some guesses about value capture, moats, right? Where are things going to coalesce? Um, and then and then you can kind of play that all the way and are like, all right, what's the first thing I do and how much money does it cost? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's probably me shorthanding or tweeting out my, my box of his adventure or not. But I, I do think, I don't know, I do encourage more and more people to start from that lens of dreaming about how the world works, as opposed to getting, starting from a granular pace of, I want to build, so I'm going to build X. So yeah. everyone, every, there's enough outliers in Silicon Valley that you can convince yourself of any, any strategy and any path if you really wanted to. Totally. Yeah, yeah. The prompts you gave me that uh, that really made me think were, yeah, 
what are the necessary, or let me start over. The prompts that you gave me that made me really think were, you know, how will the world look in 10 years? What, what are the necessary components that will enable the world to work that way? Are, are they already being built? What are the problems that will emerge in that world that you could solve? Or what are the net new opportunities enabled only in that world? Can you talk more about that or maybe give a, of an example just to make it more, more concrete? Once you get into a worldview, there's actually an interim step that I recommend everybody. You say like, one, be granular and specific. I think saying like the internet will be a thing isn't as helpful as like, I just, billions of people will be connected to the internet buying things. Like just that level of, of granularity or specificity, I think makes it easier to imagine all of the all of the things that exist in that world in order to enable that world. Um, so yeah, I think once you get addicted to it, the, the thing to really do is to give yourself some kind of score of how convinced am I? You know what I mean? Like on a, on a scale of one to five, like, Am I like a three that the world's going to work this way? Or am I a five out of five? Like, where am I on conviction about this worldview? Because that's going to be, that, I mean, it's a hard road. Like, it's going to matter that you're really convinced that it's going to be that end state. And then the other thing too is like, be honest with yourself on a scale of one to five. Like, how much have you earned that insight? You know, like, uh, Have you lived it, breathed it, studied it enough to get it? And you can go with a one and a one or a five and a one. But I think having that reflection for yourself is a really good gating item. Um, once you do that, then you can kind of go, great, what are all the things that need to be built that make the world work that way, right? If things aren't built, <laughs> start there and figure out what 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 gets built in what order and is that in your skill set, right? I think that uh, that the next intellectual challenge, if you look and go, shit, I'm really convinced the world's going to work that way. Kind of everything we need is in. It's just a matter of timing for the world to develop that way. Then you can go, what are the problems, right? When when everybody is running on SaaS, <laughs> right? When every application is cloud hosted and being bought on a subscription basis, what are the challenges, right? Well, you might lead you to AWS or subscription-based billing, right? You can kind of talk your world, a kind of talk yourself with a friend. It's hard to do in isolation, but like you can begin to imagine some of the credible problems that exist when you're right about how the world works, right? Know, every, you get convinced everyone's going to be buying things online. Maybe you started a cardboard company. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like you're like, okay, when everyone's buying online, that creates some real challenges. And you might go, shit, the thing to actually do is buy cargo delivery vans in Stockton. Um, and then, and then I think that the, the related one to that, that's always hard to do some problems is like, are there new opportunities? Are there new businesses that can be built? Are there new, are there new when, when the entire world is AI native, right? After I get past infrastructure and problems created, are there just, wild net new experiences products etc that can be can be delivered um and and so i i i kind of i encourage people to walk through that intellectual journey and i find that like it gives you it gives you the space to be creative right which, which i think a lot of people ideating who want to build don't give themselves or at least give them right they jump so quickly to product business product business which you need to get to i, I think but early on in the journey I think a lot of the special sauce in any organization you build, whether that's venture backed or a nonprofit um, or, or a bootstrap is like the special stuff starts from the journey. And, and you know what I mean? And being long dated on the timeline and, uh, and being able to be creative. Gearing towards closing here. If uh, anyone here is a uh, listening is an incredible operator, I highly recommend doing a whiteboarding session with, with Will if you're lucky. Uh, <laughs> I had the, the benefit right there. of, There's uh, whiteboards of doing everywhere. and really enjoyed it. Um, Will, any any closing thoughts on the PhD or more broadly related to our, our conversation? And also, audience, besides the PhD, if you want to hear Will uh, be on more podcasts, please do let him know because I've been trying to convince him for over a year that he should be uh, either a guest or, or hosting uh, hosting more because you have lots of thoughts on venture and people people want to hear about him in startups. Listen, listen more, more, more love and feedback is always good and encouraging. We have a couple in mind that uh, hopefully we can get organized and at least drop one of them. Um, no, I just I'd encourage anyone that is building to walk through it in a very intellectually honest way. Don't start with any presuppositions on the kind of capital you're going to need. Try to start from it as first principles as possible on what you know and how convinced you are and then let kind of logic dictate you through it. I think on the other side for people who want to be venture capitalists who are venture capitalists and are kind of I mean there's plenty of them who like have a great playbook and don't need my have way more carry than I do and don't need my my expertise, but I, I think to the extent you're looking for some guideposts, being honest with yourself about the type of capital you have, 
the consistent underwriting that this is a luck based endeavor where you've got to have decision making processes that you can execute x amount of time and that's how you get the odds in your favor and really deciding for yourself what your approach to blackjack is going to be and then the final nuance on that that I think is hard is it's one thing to read the book on blackjack the problem is the optimal strategy actually depends on how large your chip stack is and so I think that's the final thing for individuals that are investing to be a, once you kind of in you kind of come to the conclusion you're playing a luck based game that has probabilities that's about decision making you really do have to go and understand how many how many hands of blackjack, so to speak, you're going to be playing. I, I think the optimal decision for slow early on is not necessarily the optimal decision making framework for slow at this scale, just given the the end of end of opportunities we're gonna we're gonna process. Yeah, but w- one choice in that is also how big should the chip stack be? And and one one thing I've wondered is it possible to get the benefits of a big fund in terms of a big team without having a big fund? by having other sort of businesses tied to it. But I, I think you would dispute sort of that even the big team adds adds that much value uh, in, in, in the first place. But that, that's something that I've been curious about. Yeah, I mean, I think this gets into like a longer follow-up conversation about what it kind of, are you playing an asset manager product game, right? Where you want to be long technical innovation and, they, and you just need to buy it in the right size at the right time for your for your strategy? Or are you practicing core venture capital, which... Will never drive amazing top line revenue in a business, but can can drive outsized returns relative to the equity and the people. So that's a whole well, uh, longer we'll conversation. That a cliffhanger for for next time. Will, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a great episode. All right, bud. Thanks for having me. Turpentine VC is a podcast from Turpentine, the network behind Moment of Zen and Econ 102. If you liked the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store or rate us on Spotify.